yourselves and telling us a little bit about what your companies do and why you feel qualified to talk about uh, customer conversations online. Sure. Uh, so my name is Mikael, uh, and as you can hear from my broken English, I'm from Europe. But SendDesk as a company is now based in the US. We're headquartered in San Francisco. And basically what we do is we provide you with a, a customer service platform on demand. It's cloud-based and it helps you stay on top of all your customer conversations online through the channels that you communicate with your customers. Great, I'm Brett Hurt. I'm the founder and CEO of Bizarre Voice. I'm actually in here from Austin, Texas, where our headquarters is. We also have an office here in, in Paris and London and Munich and Stockholm. Um, very happy to be here. Bizarre Voice is a platform for customer to customer conversations and software as a service. Um, we actually power websites like Argos Homebase and uh, Walmart and Best Buy. And when you see those customer conversations occurring in the form of things like customer reviews, that's actually our software. So we, we don't have a consumer brand, but um, we're much like Akamai and that you probably use this all over the web, you just didn't know it was Bizarre Voice. So you're like the widget on websites. Yeah, we're the software as a service platform on websites powering that part. And in some cases now, that's 90% of their website. 90% now is user generated content uh, from you know several years ago where there was nothing on their site that was user generated. Nicole, you are business to consumer, right? Well, um, so our product, we provide our, uh, our product to businesses. So it's businesses implementing our software. We have, uh, we have customers of all kinds of, uh, in all industries. Uh, here in France, we have La Post and uh, Liberation using our service. Um, we have a, a bunch of like high profile European customers. We have a lot of startups, including Groupon, Dropbox, uh, Airbnb and these kind of companies using Sendesk to provide uh, great customer service to their customers. And their customers can be businesses, but it can also be uh, consumers. What's the difference between what you do and what Wendy does and get satisfaction? <laughs> 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 I've never figured this one out. Finally, I have you in front of me. Well, Tell me. As, you as used to be was... neighbors in the same building, and I still am not clear on what yeah. Sendesk does, even though you're gone now. So, um, so Wendy, not here, who's still in the cocktail bar, provides a... And she's still uh, at Sean Parker's. <laughs> uh, Wendy provides a, uh, what gets satisfaction, they provide a support community. What we provide is a backend for your... Well, it's a backend platform for complaints, right? We provide a backend, plat a backend platform for all your employees to engage with their customers. So when, when requests comes in, we can make sure that it gets routed to the right people in your organization and that they can deal with them within kind of the service windows and so on that you set up. So I was in the car this morning with a VP from PepsiCo, who you're meeting with uh, at two, I think. Yes. And he was telling me about Gatorade Mission Control. And if, for those of you that don't know, and I don't expect you to know, uh, Gatorade Mission Control is an experiment that they're doing out of the PepsiCo offices in Chicago. And it's actually a glass enclosure in the middle of the office with five different people from five different parts of the company um, sitting and working in a transparent environment, looking at screens of customer conversations. Sure. And they've got someone from product, they've got someone from marketing, they've got someone from sales. They're really trying to get all, because it's, you, you, you guys understand this. So customer, com, com, customer feedback is coming in, and it's usually coming into one part of the company. And that it's siloed from the rest of the company, so you're going to get the feedback, and yet, people in product don't ever get to talk to the people that they're making products for. And people in sales don't understand how, what they're selling, essentially. So PepsiCo and Gatorade specifically is trying to get all of the, um, all of the different parts of a business talking and having a conversation about what the customer conversations are and putting it in, in the middle of the office so everybody understands that that's mission control. That's number one priority. So um, my question for you guys is, what is the value, if, if, if a big brand, if a big consumer brand like Pepsi is doing this, what is the value, because there's clearly a value of listening to your customers and aggregating their conversations. Hey, Whitney. I'll listen next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, feel free. I was like, I swear I saw her at 6 a.m. <laughs> She's awake. If you oh guys gosh. ever want to have fun, go to the now breakfast at your hotel at 
5.30 a.m. <laughs> Just you meet the coolest people. Okay, we've officially ignored the Four and a half. So, to, so would you like me to answer your question? Well, no. Wendy, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then I'll, I'll repeat the question sure. for everybody. I was, I was deep into another interview. I apologize. Um, about me, I'm the CEO of Get Satisfaction. I've been Get Satisfaction since the uh, spring of '09. Having a blast. Clearly. Clearly. Sorry, in France. What can you do? Get lost. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. So what does Get Satisfaction do? Get Satisfaction, customer engagement platform, helping companies and customers come together, build stronger relationships, um, 60,000 customers, 3,000 paying, solid business. So I was just saying that Pepsi has, has devoted a part of the Gatorade offices in Chicago to, li to listening to customer feedback, like systematically processing it and letting it, and filtering it throughout the whole, uh, the hierarchy of, of uh, I don't know, business segments, sectors, uh, <laughs> whatever that is. Uh, I'm glad I amuse you. <laughs> Something in a business. Uh, for those of you that you don't know, I'm, I'm very, a huge fan of enterprise software. <laughs> My point is that Pepsi is devoting these uh, hardcore resources to, to processing the conversation. And so clearly there's a value. And my question was, what is the value? And why do you think it's increasing? <laughs> so, okay, um, I've been in the, in the customer service uh, uh, industry for five years. And what I've seen over the last five years is that, like five years ago, you, you were, you, you know, your support center, there was a car center, and you had terminology like uh, customer deflection. So it was all about keeping your customers away from your company, basically. Once they bought something, keep them away because it's only trouble. I think now companies are more and more realizing that it's a long-term relationship with the customer. It's a total life uh, the value of the customer that is important to invest in. And that's why kind of the customer service operations, the customer engagement operations have become revenue centers in organizations and are increasingly... Uh, yeah, you guys, we're being told that we can't be foreign accounts. Okay, all right. We need to be two. Maybe it's two. making for bad video. Bad TV. Boring. Sorry to bore you, audience. Go on. Value of engaging your customers across business segments. Um, yeah. So now it's 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 increasingly valuable for, uh, or it's increasingly important for companies to uh, embrace their customers, understand them a lot better, build that relationship like uh, like that is so difficult to do today, where everything is online. You know, meeting somebody, shaking their hands, like when you shook the hand of Sarkozy, now you have a relationship with him. I did shake his hand. Yeah, I exactly. We do have a relationship with <laughs> And you will, if you could, you would definitely vote for him the next time. And that's the kind, of, a, that's the kind of relationship that uh, companies are <laughs> looking to have with their customers. So one, one company um, that that reminds me of is Dell. Dell has a new social listening center and Michael Dell himself kicked off the um, opening of it, and it's, it's, it's a command center where they have um, everything from the product reviews um, and questions and answers that, that we're powering on the Dell site to uh, social listening where they're going and grabbing it out from Facebook and Twitter. And it's incredibly powerful. I mean, one of the things that Dell's been able to do is when they first launched, they found that they had a 3.7 out of 5 average rating for their products. And their head of products, who has a thousand people on his team worldwide, said, I'm going to get to a four and a half out of five star. And his team said, how? And he said, well, it's the first time in history where word of mouth is digitally archived. So we actually know exactly what our customers are saying to each other about our products. And he took me out to lunch to celebrate when they made that goal exactly on time in 15 months. And now, Every time they launch a product um, in that command center, they look and see exactly what people think of it. And if it's below a four, they'll actually kill the product in a very short period of time. So it, it's, it's very transformational. It's the first time in history where you've got this kind of direct input. And I think that's the beauty of it is that, is that 
um, you know, all of these executives, all of these leaders in, in product and marketing are rediscovering the voice of the customer, which... Well, Dell was reactionary, right? Wasn't it a response to Jeff Jarvis's Dell help? No, it wasn't. I mean, that was, that was actually early on. That was, that was, uh, that was more about um, the decision to outsource uh, the call center to India. And, uh, and there was a negative reaction to that, and that's what Jeff Jarvis was, was on, and they actually reversed that decision. Um, based on customer feedback. Based on, based on customer feedback and, 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 uh, and Jeff Jarvis, yeah. And are, I mean, so, this is always interesting. Aren't you basically, because the idea of online, the online space as a marketplace and as a, as a place where anyone can be heard is really liberating, right? But yesterday, Jeremiah Oyang's uh, social media marketing expert, I guess, brought up this interesting idea. Aren't you basically giving your customers a right to be whiny brats or bitches? Like, aren't you giving your customers like a, a platform just to whine and scream and be on Twitter and at reply you and say, why didn't you answer my phone call in a minute? Or why aren't you giving me free Pepsi? Or like, I want an upgrade. I'm like, aren't you just like unleashing a Pandora's voice of complaint? Well, I mean, <laughs> Pandora's box of complaints. W wouldn't you want to know that? Yeah. We we want our customers, our companies, to have an opportunity to listen, to engage, so we can respond and have others help too. I think that's the power of what's going on. I mean, I've been in customer relationship management for a long, long time. I don't think there's ever been an opportunity like we have today to really understand your customers. And if you're building a business, as we are, at different stages, I mean, it's, it's what drives the next everything, the next marketing campaign, the next product cycle. It should. And if it doesn't, then you're really not taking advantage, in my view, of the number one growth opportunity we have, and that is social, opportunity, social growth. So what's the best way, I want to hear all three of your answers on this, what's the best way to deal with negative feedback? Sure, well, I mean, first of all, you have, our product. Yeah, you have to, well, let's just frame it by saying that worldwide, because we track this worldwide, because our voice is in um, 21 international languages now, multiple dialects, and so we actually benchmark this by country. Worldwide, the average is a 4.3 out of 5 star. That means 80% of product reviews are 4 or 5 star. Um, so people mostly are saying positive things. Now, the thing in a 5 star review, is a lot of times people say, gosh, I really wish you made it in this color. LLB, for example, found that people kept on saying that about a certain set of sweaters and they produced the additional colors people wanted as a result of five-star reviews and they doubled their sales of those sweaters. Um, so it, if you get a negative comment, which you will, I mean, it is an average, it's really a gift at the end of the day. Uh, because people will tell you exactly, the, well, they're, they're telling each other exactly what you need to do to fix that product. And we've seen that when our clients react to that, they can dramatically reduce returns. And actually, uh, William Sonoma, for example, stopped using three of their vendors as a result of this type of commentary um, because they found out why they had high returns in these products and they didn't know. They never had that source of ground truth before. So you're sitting on, I think, the most valuable data asset in the history of commerce. I mean, this is, this is the actual representation of ground truth. This is what we've been trying to get at through surveys, through focus groups, but now you actually have the power of knowing. How do you filter the noise? Like after my talk on, or my interview on Monday, like all the Twitter comments were like, Alexia is pretty vacant, or Alexia is, <laughs> or, or great interview, or, or, or your voice is too loud, or uh, it was just all different, all different, and I didn't know where to start. I'm like, I can't, I basically have to be a different person. <laughs> well, that's the analytics that's opportunity. That's what they want. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> My customers want me to be somebody else. <laughs> that's, that's why analytics matter in this. Um, there's a vast volume of data out there. We've served to date 260 billion impressions of customer-to-customer -customer conversations. It's a lot of information. 
and you have to have analytics in place. That's why these things like these social listening centers, like you heard at Gatorade, are being established so that you can filter through and get to the heart of what the customers are saying and do something about it as a business. Well, in, in your case, it's not, it's not necessary if you want to do something about it. That's basically up to you as a business. Well, I've had, I've had feedback before, and it was good feedback. I had feedback of stop giggling so much. And, you know, I stopped. And I didn't get that feedback. Before. I think you should, I think you should start giggling some more. Yeah. I, Depends I on what panel you're on. Not giggling. Trying to not to giggle. Okay, pass. Um, and, and so that, I listened to that because it was from a peer, right? So do some customers have more value? Yes. Okay. But I think so. Like, so good negative feedback. Good feedback. Negative feedback. You gotta embrace it all, and you need to figure out how to learn from it. So I think one of the capabilities is. To it's like every time there's a like bad satisfaction meeting. Sometimes, every time nobody, somebody's not happy with the service, with your service, we surface that information on our yeah. our internet. Yeah. And that just that just gives a company wide uh, acceptance and understanding on what's going on, and everybody's on it. You know, to see is it can be a whiner, but it can also be somebody with very valuable feedback that we can incorporate in our product, incorporate in our processes, or incorporate in our company culture. But in terms of businesses, I agree. I mean, it's the analytics. The, the analytical tools are very sophisticated these days, and it allows you to understand the reputation of certain customers. If they have a pattern of doing this, you know, if it's if they have a uh, propensity to buy more. So that, for now, all businesses have that opportunity to, to really understand. At the end of the day, though, this economic um, environment we're in really dictates a, a different level of transparency, a different level of openness. And we experience that in our businesses. And even here at the web, I mean, there's candid, open, here's what's working, here's not. I mean, no one's kind of hiding behind thinking they have the perfect business, the perfect product, the perfect anything. So I think more and more that is the norm. And so maybe it wasn't in the past. And, so we were kind of freaked out because we were all control freaks and now we know control is an illusion and so we have to just go with it and accept it and work it the best we can and if we can't solve all the problems customers have, we stay gracefully. Thank you for that feedback. We're unable to make that change until the next quarter. Sorry that has an impact on you. But not responding, ignoring. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have to be schizophrenic with your product roadmap or your own image. Well, I don't think that's required. I think it's more of an acknowledgement that it's, it exists. You so might, that's you the right way to do business, don't you think? With one more point uh -huh. on this. So it's not like customers weren't already talking to each other negatively before the advent of the web. It's just that nobody knew what they were saying, and so they were trying to get at it through focus groups, through surveys. But all of those mediums weren't great because they were biased by default. People were paid to be there. Um, and so you have, for the first time in human history, word of mouth, which has always been with us. It's been with us since the beginning of the tribes. Where were the hunt, where's the hunting good? Where's the fishing good? How do I not get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger? And so now you finally have this information. And we're just now at the very beginning of understanding what to do with it. It's, PepsiCo is just now setting up the social listening center. My daughter is seven years old. She's going to grow up this way. Marketing merchandising is just going to naturally incorporate this. And this is going to be in every textbook. I mean, this is going to be what she's studying. She's, she's going to say, Dad, how the heck did you make decisions before having this information? I'm going to say, well, we did the best we could. But it wasn't that great. It's a monumental shift, like with Jawbone, right? So Jawbone launched these ups, right? And I would say about 30% of them, I'm just making up a number, 30% uh, of them didn't work from, from just watching Twitter and watching Facebook and word of mouth and people whispering. Like I, I had a friend of mine be like, I'm like, I want an up, she's like, don't buy one, they don't work. <laughs> I heard people talking about the banality. They're really funny. And so you'd get this, there was a whisper campaign, right? I still, I, I think it's lovely, and I, I, despite listening to complaints about them, I went bomb and got on that work 
unfortunately enough. But they seriously didn't work, and people were talking about it. It was on Twitter. The, people, the press started to write about it. There was a Gizmodo article that said, why up is amazing, but you shouldn't buy one. I, I wrote a post on it. And I, I heard from someone at Job Alone, they're like, oh, we know you. You wrote that blog post. Like, we just had a, a meeting about it. And I'm like, oh, they're having a meeting about, about bloggers. And I heard that they were having conversations about people talking about the product's severe flaws. And normally, like when, when I was a, still in college, you wouldn't, companies were not fast responding to your complaints. What Jawbone did was stop their launch yesterday. They stopped the launch, stopped producing products, put out a letter, I got a letter in my email from Hussein, and everybody did, not just special bloggers, but like every, some, every person who bought it up, saying that they were stopping the product, they were going to focus on the flaws and relaunch when they had figured out what was wrong. And it's terrifying, I think, to listen, to hear the whispers, to be overwhelmed with negative feedback, and to respond. But the value add of your response is huge. I would buy a second up, right? I can't, I, I, I can't wait for them to fix the problem. I would recommend them to a friend. I know that they care. So my question is, you have all this data out there, right? How do you make sure that that data flows throughout? The, you have all this data about what your customers are saying. How do you make sure that that data f goes through all departments in the company rapidly enough to respond in time to still win your customer? Because if they had waited a month or not done anything, I would be like, I would be part of the whispers in the elevators. But the problem is, the problem isn't really to get everybody's attention to it. Now, if it's out there on Twitter, if it's out there on the blogs, every employee knows about it. Knows about it. So it is up to the company to, uh, to react to it and figure out how to best react to it and making sure that you have all the information available. But the problem today, the problem is not how to you know get the information that, that I think we just talked about. It's not how you obtain the information. The information is that it's the, the, the fact is that the information is out there in fast, you know, a lot of it, and you just you have to. As a, as a company, it's an exercise to react to it and embrace it and have a company culture where you, you execute on, 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 the, on the criticism and on the customer feedback. So I think you know, the, 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 the company culture of the future is an execution culture on customer feedback. Customer service, new marketing, right? being able to respond, not overdo it. But again, it's not getting the information, it's just being I think systematic and graceful in responding over time and not letting it sit there. I think the biggest problem sometimes is just letting it sit there, right, and not, you know, having some communication plan. I mean, this in some ways is PR 101, right? You just have better tools to do it. You have to, you have to codify the data to departments. So I'll give you an example. LLV, when they first launched, they had a pair of boots, one of the top selling pairs of boots. And it was a four and a half out of five star. And it, within a week, it crashed to two and a half out of five. Well, the way our data is codified under analytics is we shot an email off to the boot category manager and said, hey, you need to pay attention to this. This is a problem. He went back to the stock room. He found that the 2,000 pairs it reordered were all mismanufactured with a real fit issue by the supplier. Now that would have normally taken L.L. Bean three months to find out. It would have had a massive amount of returns. It would have had brand damage. They were able to find that out in a couple of days. So that's the power. All the economists talk about how technology will lift efficiency. I think that word of mouth online will lift efficiency more than any other medium in history when it comes to marketing and merchandising and product development. And we're just now at the very beginning of seeing that play out. So is the age of top-down marketing over? Can you no longer come up with this grand message and uh, force it down your customers' throats? I don't know that I agree with that. I mean, I think that at the end of the day, we're all, if you're a CEO of a company, you're responsible for positioning, you know, understanding how your capability aligns with segments you're going after. It's just the distribution of that message that's so different. And it's tapping into that which works, right? And you get feedback on that too. So it's not a cram down relative to messaging, but it is a way, you know, there's so many different channels and ways to get it out now 
and to get feedback when it's not right. I mean, you're constantly iterating, making changes to that. I think marketing is important as always. Yeah. It's just the way it's developed. Don't you think? And the yeah, way you understand I mean, it. If, it, if, I if you if you look at look at Steve Jobs. Um, and how much of a showman he was when it came to launching the products. Well, he actually did a very good job, or at least their ad agency did a very good job of listening to ground truth. And the ultimate, the ultimate example of that in my mind was the PC versus Mac campaign. The reason that ad agency tried it. I feel like there's a gr the, the gratuitous Jobs reference on every panel. It was like Steve Jobs. <laughs> Sorry, I too soon. So I mean, you know, th th think about that. Just like campaign. Steve would say. Camp campaign. Well, that campaign was based on ground truth. So it was the actual conversations people were having about PCs and having about Macs. So I think advertising in the future will be rooted on the real, as opposed to trying to make you think that you're going to drive this small car like a Ferrari around windy roads. That's just not reality. So I think it's I think it's going to be based on authentic. Uh, truth as opposed to um, fantasy. So what do you guys think about this panel? Come on customers. <laughs> Let me hear your voices. Cool, thumbs up, thumbs down, meh. <laughs> I think we should talk about um, engagement a bit and really what that means. It's a word in our industry that gets banded a lot. Jeremiah talks about it. I mean, it's, and, and I thought a lot about this engagement concept. Like, what does that mean um, to customers being happy, buying more, and telling others? And it's that it's it's the online ex word of mouth experience that gives brands, companies, product services any chance to really engage. But to me, it has an emotionality attached to it, which is what the web is all about. So if you have somehow hooked into this. Uh, you use the term ground truth, this emotionality of a customer, and then you have a chance to engage. And I think that's what companies of all sizes need to think about, is just what does that emotionality look like? How does that get extended? Delight, actually. It looks like delight. Okay. <laughs> that's what Marissa Mayer said. She said, well, I delight. ask me my product managers, what, to delight. what delights you? Because you need to delight customers. Well, I, the reason I use this emotionality word is I think it goes to the negative as well as the positive, right? And so that would say that pop negative isn't bad because if I have a reaction that's less than favorable and I feel hurt as a result, then I'm connected to you. And I think that's what we need now to grow our businesses is a deep connection, which is an emotionality connection to the brand, to the product, to the service, because then I tell others. How does, this, how does emotionality scale, though? You know. That's that's called that's called the web. It's called yeah, mobile. It's, cool. it's called Facebook. I mean, honestly, that's how do you think mobile has changed the landscape of these conversations? Yeah, it has. I mean, you know, these conversations now are much more prevalent. When we started Bizarre Boys, Facebook was close to public. Twitter didn't even exist, and there was no iPhone or Android. And so now there's a massive explosion in these conversations, and that's allowing ground truth to express itself even more, and therefore for people that react like. Gatorade, and it is a reaction because you have to be listening. You have to listen first to actually take part in a conversation. You can't just show up at a conversation and jump right in completely off context. Yeah. Um, and so brands are listening and uh, consumers are going to win as a result. And I think the, the impact of Facebook and mobile for, again, companies of all sizes, then you have to be where your customers are. Now, people use that phrase a lot, lots of companies say that, but that is really true. That means you have to be on a mobile platform, you have to be in the social systems, you have to take advantage of the social web, you have to bring that into your applications of record inside the company. But there's a big responsibility, not just B to C companies, all companies, to be where your customers are, be wherever they're interacting. Great. I think we've got six seconds. Anything you want to say? Any questions? How do we make enterprise software less boring? I want it to be more fun. Why do you not like enterprise software? Why do I not like enterprise software? I think because it doesn't have that emotionality. They don't do a very good job. It just, you know, somebody said, don't you know that iTunes is run on SAP? I'm like, I, I actually, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Oh, I know. I, I, I could talk to these people all day. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank um, you guys for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you guys for listening.